Hi, I'm Chris, I'm from CGI, and I'm going to answer the question, uh, how can big companies manage to provide for their project by managing so many different sectors uh, in the IT company to coordinate and contribute what is needed on time? For example, a big company getting all the resources to effectively launch a big project within the time limit. Um, so a bit of a long question, but I, I guess ultimately it's saying, how do you manage a big and complex project uh, successfully? Um, and for me, uh, the key um, part the, to, to do that is basically strong communication. Um, I work in a team of around 80 um, developers and architects and specialists, and we have to communicate really effectively every single day to make sure that we are delivering for the customer and the client uh, on time and, and more importantly, effectively giving them what they need. Um, we're also an agile project, which means we run uh, these incredibly um, fast cycles called sprints, two week sprints. And basically we, we might not necessarily know going from sprint to sprint what we're going to achieve um, longer term. We're literally constantly improving and evolving on what we're delivering. Um, gone are the days of something called waterfall where you design, decide what your requirements are and everything you're going to deliver at the start. And then you spend uh, a period of time delivering um, those things with Agile. Um, we're constantly evolving what we're trying to uh, deliver as we grow in our understanding uh, and, and the customer grows in their understanding about what they want and what they need. Um, and it's exactly the kind of uh, methodology you need to succeed in, uh, in cyber and, and cybersecurity projects because um, the threat is changing all the time. Um, but to succeed with this team, AT, uh, working with all kinds of different skill sets, uh, application specialists and different, different um, uh, tools and, and things, um, strong communication is absolutely essential. Um, I'm one of the project managers, so it's my job to make sure we're communicating. Um, I lead and manage daily stand-up calls with the team. Um, if there are problems and uh, escalations that need to be made, I handle those and take them to, to the right, right parts of business. Um, you've also got to trust your employees. Um, at CGI, we go to great lengths to employ um, absolutely amazing people. Our, our CGI members are, are, are all absolutely incredible. Um, but we can trust our members uh, to deliver um, what we need them to deliver uh, on time. And so um, I can trust them to do, do a good job. I don't need to go and micromanage and, uh, and keep a, you know, a close eye on what they're doing. I just know and can trust they'll deliver the right thing. Um, so yeah, how do you deliver a big and complex project? Um, there's, you know, you can do courses on project management, there's, you know, many month long courses, but for me, it all boils down to uh, communication, strong communication skills, um, and also, like I say, having a really good team under you that you can trust, uh, and I, I trust my CGI members to, to deliver. Uh, thank you. I'm Rob Clark, and I'm going to be trying to answer this question. Are we ever going to reach a point where passwords are too insecure? and must be replaced and if so what could they be replaced with so i'm going to try and whiz through this as quickly as i can so first things first how are passwords beaten there's a couple of different techniques you can use but the easiest way to get hold of your passwords is using people social engineering tricking people installing malware phishing using data breaches that kind of thing password complexity is an arms race we're constantly battling in between the complexity of the password and the processing power required to crack that password when you're considering sort of brute force style attacks. Fortunately, the math is on our side. So with seven characters, just a basic password like this would be very easy and quick to, to crack. You make it a little bit longer and suddenly it becomes a lot more difficult to crack. But even so, we can do even better than that. We get some uppercase, we get some different sort of punctuation in there, we get some symbols, numbers, then it becomes sort of unreasonable. And at that length, you're not likely to be able to get this password anytime soon using current or even future technology. And this is a kind of table to show you how that kind of scales upwards and how quickly it goes from being sort of 20 seconds all the way up to billions of years. So I'd recommend when it comes to setting a password for yourself, to use the XKCD method, as we call it, um, which is four kind of uh, words that you pick from a dictionary with a couple of modifications to it. So misspelling one word, capitalizing each word, adding two numbers onto the end and sort of uh, using dashes between the words uh, and making sure it's, it's long enough. So that is an example of a very strong password. In the future, however, while passwords might be considered to be good enough for now, things could certainly change. So quantum computing is out there. Uh, and that's got a lot of techniques that could really make things a lot faster for password cracking. 
uh, application specific integrated circuits or ASICs, uh, techniques specifically designed to crack passwords are coming out all the time. Uh, and there could be ways to even reverse hashing algorithms in the future. But this is all theoretical at the moment. And for now, passwords are generally considered good enough when they are kind of at that standard that I showed previously. Alternatives, we've got biometrics, email authentication, uh, logging in using Facebook, Google or Apple, like a, a third party to, to verify your trust. You've got smart tokens and then you've got multi-factor authentication. So using a combination of all of these, much in the same way as a longer password increases your, your security, using multiple factors of authentication helps even more than that. And that is really the most secure way to do it. And the FIDO Alliance uh, are in the process of promoting those kind of authentication standards to reduce our reliance on passwords. Hi, my name's Andrew Peck, and I'm an innovation consultant for CGI. Part of my job is looking at future technologies and working out how soon they'll be ready for adoption. One of the best questions for me, one of the most exciting, was Sarah at the Stroud High School for Girls who asked, how realistic is Frankenstein and what does the future of computational biology look like in comparison? Let's break this down. How realistic was Frankenstein? Well, we must remember Mary Shelley was writing in 1818 and presented Frankenstein, the man, the doctor, the surgeon, the researcher, not the monster, as a surgical and scientific visionary. To understand how far ahead Shelley was looking, we must understand the surgeons of the day. I give you a man called Robert Liston. Operating at about the same time Shelley was writing, he was a published researching surgeon who wrote the textbook Practical Surgeries. He believed, because there were no anaesthetics, that the best surgeries were fast surgeries. And these weren't little operations. These were taking a limb off in under two and a half minutes. His most famous operation being the removal of an entire leg in 28 seconds. During the process, he removed his assistant's fingers, meaning the patient and his assistant died of sepsis, and a witness to the operation keeled over and died of shock, making this history's most deadly operation. And he was a contemporary of Shelley, so how far ahead was Shelley looking? Well, many people these days have received donor organs. Some of those donations aren't even from humans. They might have the heart valve grafted into them from a cow. They might have a digital pacemaker fitted to maintain the beat of their heart. So that understanding of the blend between biology and electricity and being able to assemble a functioning body from disparate donor parts was 200 years in advance. So was Shelley right? Was Frankenstein accurate? In some ways, yes, and eventually. And obviously there were things that Shelley didn't know, like how quickly a body would decay and how quickly you had to transfer a, an organ from a living donor to a, a recipient. But in the end, her science wasn't too far off. So let's think about the second part, computational biology. Well, for those of you who don't know, this is using a computer to simulate the body. It might be letting a surgeon operate on a virtual patient to practice. It might be modeling the folds of proteins or, or trialing a drug in a simulated environment. And these things all happen now. It's why you've got your COVID vaccines developed so quickly. It's why um, medical school students practice on realistic uh, simulated patients rather than a real patient when they're learning. You can read about it. Go and read Craig Venter's um, A Life Decoded, where he's modeled the human genome. And then understand that those successors are the Robert Liston of today. So to look 200 years in the future, we've got to be talking about modeling the brain and the way people think. Now, can this be done? Not now, not accurate. But the future is out there in today's science fiction authors, whether we look at Adrian Tchaikovsky's Children of Time or Damien Boy's Lost Time series, both of which feature characters whose brains and minds are digitally uploaded and copied and reproduced. So could this happen one day? 
Well, yes, there are technologies that are currently in their infancy, like um, quantum computing, that may one day enable this to happen. However, they are at the same level of development that surgical techniques were in the early 1800s. This is a topic that interests you. That means there are plenty of opportunities for research. And whether you want to get your hands dirty or whether you want to work on the code side of life, there are opportunities to pursue this topic in research as your career advances. Or maybe, just maybe, you want to tell a story about where this will all be in 200 years time. Listen to you teachers, bye for now. So Ted, aged 11, wants to know how does motion technology work? My name is Jacob and I'm a senior software engineer at a company in Cheltenham. Motion controls are built on two technologies, first of which is accelerometers. So an accelerometer uses magnetism to measure move, whether the object that it is attached to is moving in certain directions. So it'll be X, Y or Z in the X plane, the Y plane or the Z plane. Um, so it'll have magnetic capacitors on the inside of the chip, which correspond to those planes. So then if you move it up, the magnetism relative to the up direction, whatever up means to you, will change. And that signal is processed and therefore it can understand itself moving through 3D space. And so game controllers have taken that technology into their advantage to be able to produce these kinds of controllers whereby the user is able to use motion as an input to their video games, which obviously feels much better than just pushing on a lever or pulling on a lever. While the accelerometer is able to measure moving in a direction, a weakness of the technology um, is that it is not easily able to measure the force of that movement. So while it knows it's moved, it doesn't know how much force has gone into that movement, which is, depending on what you're using the motion control for, quite a key aspect. So this is where gyroscopes come in. So the way the gyroscope works is that within the uh, MEMS gyro sensor, they have a very small uh, component that moves within the gyroscope relative to the rotational movement. So it's kind of like when you spin a water bottle around, the water is forced to the bottom of the bottle by the action of spin. And that pulling gives the rotation calculation measure, not only the what, what where you're rotating, like what axis you're rotating around, but also how much force is going into that rotation. So you combine the gyroscope and the accelerometer, and that gives you movement through 3D space and a force measurement associated with that movement, like how hard are you moving the thing, how fast are you going, and also the relative rot rotation of the object, so what its orientation is in that, in that 3D space. So I think that the most obvious example of where motion controls have been implemented is in the Nintendo Wii console, which really catapulted the use of accelerometers and gyroscopes forward. And then this trend was continued with mobile phones using that same technology for tracking steps and for fitness apps. And so now the, both industries have pushed forward these technologies to the point where they're, they're really, really accurate, really efficient, really small and really cheap to make. And so to sum up, the way that motion controls work is they use accelerometers to determine direction uh, of movement and the actual um, starting and stopping points. And then the use of gyroscopes to work out the force of the movement and also any associated rotation. If you're more interested in working with accelerometers and gyroscopes uh, for the purposes of motion control, you can take a look at the Raspberry Pi Foundation and also at the Arduino 
offerings, which are both small form factor computer chips that you can plug in together that include things like gyroscopes and accelerometers to perform experiments at home. I highly recommend that you Google both of those and, and see if you see anything that you find interesting. Thank you very much. Hi, got a question here from Evie, year eight, uh, the Dean Academy, and she asks, why when you go on a website, does it say accept cookies? And what are cookies and how are they used? Well, what are cookies? So cookies are small text files and they're stored on your computer and they're used by websites that you visit. And they're intended to improve and simplify all the interactions between yourself and the website. And they also allow you to personalize the content that the website shows you. So that's why when you, maybe you go onto the BBC website, you see different things than when your friend logs on to the BBC website, because maybe they're more interested in uh, English news and you're more interested in Scottish news or something like that. Okay, so how are cookies used? So the first time that you visit a website that uses cookies, that website will create a file, a cookie file, and it will send it to your computer. And this cookie file will contain information that identifies the website you've been looking at and yourself. And so this cookie file can also be used to store other information, such as how many times you visited that website, uh, which web, which page on that website you most frequently look at, uh, or if there's any settings that you've selected, such as the color of the pages, the size of the font, or your favorite football team or a sports page. And so then the next time you visit that website, your computer will look to see if it has already got a cookie file for that website. And if it has, if it finds it, then it can use the information inside that file and send that to the website to tell the website what information to show you. And so that's how you can sort of personalize your website experience. And that's why you don't need to select your favorite color or favorite football team. Every time you open up that website, it will know what to display. And so why does a website ask you to accept these cookies? Well, these cookies, these can, they contain personal information, such as the preferences we've expressed, um, and also holds details potentially of what adverts we've clicked on, what pages we've clicked on. And so this information is being sent back to the website. And now data privacy laws means that companies can only use your personal information if they've got your permission to do so. And so that's why these websites have to ask you is it okay if you use our cookies? Okay, I hope that answers the question for you. Hi, my name is Anna Reedman. I work in Q Labs for the NCC group and I have worked here for um, two and a half years. We've been asked a question about what um, 3D modeling um, software we use within the company. Um, and as you can see, we use the Autodesk Inventor um, to create all of our designs. We have the capability to then take this software um, and convert it into files so that we can 3D print it off um, internally as well. Hi, hi, I'm Chris. I'm going to have a go at answering the quite fantastic question of uh, what are the chances of warp drive from Star Trek happening? Um, I'm a bit of a sci-fi geek myself, so saw this and, and couldn't help myself. Um, I am not a physicist, I am not a quantum physicist, uh, uh, I just enjoy sci-fi and, uh, and working technology. Um, but, so what are the chances of warp drive happening? Um, slim, anytime soon I'd suggest. Um, there are some problems with the so-called rules of physics here. So um, the great news is the laws of physics are there to be broken. So this is what physicists, engineers, chemists, biologists are doing all the time challenging the world, the models we use to, to model the world uh, around us. Um, but this one, the theory of relativity, has been around for quite a while. Um, e equals mc squared, you might have heard of. Um, if you use that equation and just, and just go through it, it's linking energy and mass. Um, when you start approaching the speed of light, you end up with some very interesting math problems uh, about the amount of energy or the size of the mass. Um, but the good news is that um, there are new theories being developed all the time, new models uh, around quantum mechanics and, and using quantum factors to, uh, to think about actually, um, are there ways around these problems? Are, are, there problem, are these problems just um, ones that we almost created ourselves? Because our model of the universe that we, we've designed. Um, 
But I think the really good news, I think, I think the, the ultimately the point I want to get over, because like I said, I'm not a quantum physicist, um, um, but I, I want to get the point over that um, science fiction is so fantastic for driving innovation and thought. So um, what might seem a bit of a joke question is actually a really good one. Um, has has technology from sci-fi ever actually been implemented? And absolutely, of course it has. Um, I remember there's an episode in Star Trek, uh, one of the original series, I can't remember which one, um, but there's a satellite that's powered by an ion engine. Um, and actually, that, those those ion-based engines actually exist, uh, you, you know, now. We, we, uh, we're able to design and build them. Um, they're just not much use in our atmosphere, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so science fiction plays an important role, I think, in innovation and technology. Um, so please do uh, do watch it, do get involved, do dream it up, do imagine it, uh, and hopefully we'll have some really exciting technology um, coming from that in the future. Warp drives for now, uh, probably not anytime soon. Um, but yeah, do some do some reading about it. I think there's lots of exciting content online um, as to problems with it and some of the theories that might be able to uh, tell us about it. Hi, I'm Colin Topping. I'm the Cyber Incident Director at Rolls-Royce and the question is from Jacob at Gloucester College is what is one thing you wish you knew before starting your career? Well, my career started an awful long time ago uh, when I was 18 which is over 30 years ago and it, uh, it started in the Air Force and so I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I think that's the uh, thing I wish I knew at the beginning was that you don't need to know what you ultimately want to do when you're 16, 18, 20, 22, uh, whether it's after school, college or, or university. Um, you, Everything will evolve. Uh, the, the job you start doing won't necessarily be the job you're doing when you're in your 50s or your 40s because you should evolve and if you, particularly if you're going to look to get into STEM, uh, that will evolve. You know, what we didn't really have the internet when, when I started uh, to any great degree. And now when you look at what we've got now, but then if you think for 10 years, never mind 30 years, it's all going to be so different. So don't, don't try and get fixated to know what your job is and what you think you're going to do for the rest of your career, because you know, it's, it's unlikely that, that you will do that. And that's a good thing, because you need to be able to evolve and adapt. And if you get into particularly technology as well, it's going to be more about lifelong learning you know, you know if you feel that you want to finish school and not have to do any more education then you'll probably find that you will uh, even if it's going to work in a shop part-time at weekends or something as they get new lines in you'll have to learn those new lines so you can tell the customers about those lines so take that forward into technology that's always going to change and you're always going to have to be as current as you can be but that the other thing you turn to learn as you become more experienced I think is that you should be comfortable that you don't know everything and, and you won't know everything and you'll have people that work with you alongside you for you as you get older um, that become subject matter experts in their own right in their own field and you'll pick up some things that that they do but don't expect that you're expected to know it all you you and I see it at, um, at meetings you can tell the people that have been more experienced and comfortable in their own skin because they're quite content, to, quite content to say, I don't understand that, can, can someone explain to it, explain that to me. So be happy with that, be happy that you, you know, it is going to be a learning, it's going to be an adventure and it's going to be fun.